Today we're studying lesson number six in the adult Sabbath school quarterly. If you don't have a quarterly, we do we have it yet? Yes, we do. We've been studying the book of Job this quarter. Can you hear me okay? Is this thing on? Sure it does. Is it okay? Quarterlies? Okay. Is it my phone? Yes. What is heaven focused on? Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, in other words, ever since Adam and Eve decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, <coughs> heaven has only had one agenda, and that is to convince man to become God-dependent instead of self-dependent. Everything, and I mean everything that has happened on this earth, for 6,000 years of recorded history, everything that has happened has been the result of human beings either making a decision to be self-dependent or God-dependent. Two Sabbaths ago, we celebrated, if you can call it that, some people celebrated, for me it was a day of mourning, the 172nd birthday of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I say a day of mourning because one of the founders of our church, and Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 24, 34, that it was his desire to come back to earth shortly after a certain number of events took place. One of the founders of our church over a period of 51 years writes in four different publications that it is not God's will for us to still be here. The first table was written seven years after 1844, 1851. So, last week when Job cursed his day of birth, could that curse become a reality? Yes or no? Why? Huh? What is the purpose of life since Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent? To find a people that will choose to become God-dependent instead of self-dependent. So, God is placing the ultimate compliment on Job, when he says, I want to break you into the graduate level of Christian living. You graduated from high school, you graduated from college, but now I want for you to get a higher degree. So, as I shared with you last week, the idea is that God is looking for a people He has to become God-dependent instead of self-dependent. What does that mean in reality? He is trying to get us to be relevant for who? Him. What is it that you like the most when you get a birthday gift or a gift for any occasion? What is it that you like about it the most? The thought behind it. The thought behind it. The person has anticipated the things that you like, maybe the things that you need, and they have selected a present that meets those requirements. So when you open the present, you say, this is exactly what I wanted, or this is exactly what I need. Isn't that what makes a present? Special. 
God is trying to tailor make each one of us to reflect what? His character. His character. Amen. And that is what's happening here. But before God tries to make us relevant for Him, He overwhelmingly makes Himself relevant to us. What can you think of in Scripture? As an instant, when God made himself relevant to human beings. How about creation? Before he created Adam and Eve, what did he do? He spent six days anticipating everything that they could possibly want or need. And then he created them and said, This is just for you. Adam and Eve decided that no, they wanted to know as much as God knew, especially about you. So, we know the result of that choice. What about uh, Exodus 20? 1 and 2. Who would like to read Exodus 20, 1 and 2? This is a very important passage because God has taken Israel out of Egypt where they have been slaves for 430 years and he's taken them on the longest route possible. No drinkable water, no food. But that they can see. Yeah, there was nothing yeah. that visually two years, two months, and one day. Numbers 1, verse 1. What is God trying to do? He's trying to make himself relevant to a people that have been slaves for 430 years. What does he tell them in verse 1 and 2 of Exodus 20? Who would like to read that? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought, brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I'm the one that what? Fulfill my promise to Abraham 430 years ago to the day. Provided you what? Plow in the daytime over you to protect you from the scorching desert. Provided you with a cloud of fire by night to protect you from the coldness of the desert. Your food protected you from your enemies, which you know very well you could see during your entire trip of two years, two months, and one day. They were eyeballing you the whole time, and you knew that they were eyeballing you the whole time. But they never touched you. Why did I do that? Because I'm trying to make myself relevant for you before I try to make you relevant for me. If we don't get this, we're going to be living a Christian life with the wrong motivation. He's describing himself as very specific truths. He's saying that there is no other God. That he is the God. There is no other. I'm the one who does everything. There is nothing else. And when you go back to this Genesis thing you talked about, I think another wonderful thing is he spoke everything into existence, but he got down on his knees and created man with his hands out of the dust of the earth. I think of what God said to him. To David, how much more can I have given you? You know? Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. After God does all of this for them, what does he inspire Moses to record in Deuteronomy 5, 15? 
remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, who's mighty arm? What's God doing here? Making himself relevant to them. In uh, Job chapter 2, verse 10. Let's read verse 9 first. Job understands a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of what God is trying to do here, which is to make himself, God, relevant to Job. And he's beginning to get it. Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Who would like to read that? Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, right here. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine in in integrity, sorry, curse God and die? But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. I say amen to that. Amen. Because according to recorded history, he is going through as bad, probably as difficult a time as we are aware of, based on recorded history, as God had allowed anyone to go through. Now keep this in mind because we're going to talk about the similarity between what God is allowing Job to go through and what Jesus went through. Do you think that maybe Adam and Eve went through the same thing when they were put out of the garden and they lost their first son? <laughs> we'll have to ask them. Do we'll they didn't them. know about a death until the animal, the first animals were you know, so I'm just wondering, I maybe mean, that was, they're all the and God and his son. I'm sure there was great, great grief when the first murder took place in that chore. Right? I'm absolutely amazed at the speed and the intensity of the devil's work here the moment God moves his, his hand blows my mind how quickly. I mean, it's a moment. It's in a moment that everything is just, this man's life is just upside down. We must never, ever forget why this is happening. Remember what we studied in the first six weeks ago in Job chapter 1, verse 8? Who would like to read Job chapter 1, verse 8? Job chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Thank you. What did we learn about the word considered? Does God know the beginning from the end? Amen. Yes. So, Satan shows up at this committee meeting, or this meeting, and what does God say to Satan? Have you zeroed in on my man, Job? Is that why you're here, Satan? Is that why you're here? By the way, the word Satan, in the first two chapters of Job, are interpreted as the adversary. Have you the adversary come here because you zeroed in on my man, Job? And then the dialogue takes place. And we know that Job loses all of his family, and except his wife, and his material possession. Then in chapter 2, who would like to read verse 3? Job, chapter 2, verse 3. 
Job chapter 2, verse 3. Palm the table. And then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? Is blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him without cause. Similar, similar dialogue here. That word considered is there again. Because now, does Satan never give up? No. It's important that we understand that. It's very important that we understand that. That is, that we're Christians. So, Satan says now, God says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, let me have his skin. And what does God say? Okay, but you just can't kill it. And we know the rest of it. So through all of this, God is trying to make himself relevant to Job. Unfortunately, at this point in time, Job doesn't understand what's happening. But it's good news that he says what to his wife? Are we ready to receive all of the blessings of God when God sees us to bless us? But we are reluctant to accept Adversity when God sees to take it away from us. So that is good. That is good news. Now, how else, let's bring this forward now to us. How has God made himself relevant to us today? What about uh, Galatians 4, 4 and 5? How is God trying to make himself relevant to you and to me today? Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. And when the fullness of the time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? So that he could redeem those that were where? Under the, law. Under the curse of the law. That is a beautiful introduction to the Incarnation. Jesus had to ethically and legally qualify to be my, be the Lamb of God before He could become the Lamb of God. Do we understand that? Yes. This is an ethical and a legal issue here. Had that not been the case, what would Satan have done? Foul play! You come down here to redeem these people with different equipment than they have to deal with me. Right? Mm -hmm. If Jesus had not identified with me at the Incarnation, then Satan would have never tried to tempt Jesus. Is Satan stupid? Did Satan know who Jesus was? Yes. Yeah, he tried to kill him before he was even one years of age. So now, in Luke chapter 4, Satan tempts Jesus three times. Now, I want for you to think about this, because it's a big issue today in the Christian world. Did Jesus identify with me at the Incarnation? It's a big, big deal. So if you can read English, we're going to solve this real quick. We have Satan, who was created by whom? Jesus. Jesus. Now coming to Jesus and tempting him how many times? Three. The created is going to tempt the creator only because he knew that he had taken on my nature and he was now vulnerable. So that solves the issue of what kind of a nature did Jesus take at the incarnation? If you have a problem with it, ask Satan. The evidence is right there in Luke chapter 4. Now that we've solved the issue of the nature of Christ, the question is, what does that mean to you and to me? Did Jesus ever sin in thought or word or action? No. He had to identify with me because I'm the one that needs redeeming. And he ethically and legally had to identify with me in order to ethically and legally redeem me. What about... Uh, 
Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Who would like to volunteer to read? Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. What are we studying here right now? What is the issue that we're studying? God trying to make himself relevant to me so that I will be willing to become relevant to God. Are, we, are you with me? That's the issue in Job. And that's the issue today. Who has Hebrews 2, 14 through 18? Volunteer. Okay. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Some very important words there. Propitiation means a sacrifice. Another important word there is obligated. Not necessary. He was obligated ethically and legally to identify with the one that he came to redeem. Yes or no? Absolutely. Yes. He was a slave just as we were. Exactly. Just as vulnerable. But he didn't get it. And that's what we're exploring here. Why is, why is all this recorded? Didn't we learn last week in 1 Corinthians 10 11, example. that all these things are recorded for what? Our example. Yeah, because God is what? There's only one agenda in heaven, and that is to what? Find a people that are willing to become God-dependent instead of self-dependent. Self -dependent. But before he asks me to be relevant for him, he makes sure that I'm convinced that he has become relevant to me. Isn't that beautiful? God never surprises us. He always prepares us for everything that He allows to happen in our lives. What a deal. What a deal. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at now Revelation 3.21. This is very important. Revelation 3.21. Who would like to read that for us? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Thank you. What is that? It's an invitation. How many of you like to receive an invitation from Jesus? This is an invitation from Jesus. Does Jesus make an invitation if he knows that you cannot accept it or live up to it? No. That's what's happening here. Jesus is inviting each of us to what? Overcome is what? What did Jesus overcome? Well, in John 16, 33, he says he overcame the world. Well, that's kind of vague. What does the world mean? He created everything. Specifically, what is he talking about? Who would like to read 1 John 2, 16? 1 John 2, 16. We're going to get real specific here. We're going to find out what it is specifically that Jesus overcame. And that he's inviting us to overcome as he overcame. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the, is of the world. Are you infected with this terminal disease as I am? Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. When I wake up, including Sabbath, everything that I naturally want to do is either bad or illegal. <laughs> That's, I don't have to be bad. I try to be bad. I'm not bad. I am genetically rotten through and through. So you don't need to wake up in the morning and say, well, I wonder if this is going to be a good day or a bad day. Well, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, 
What do we know? Satan is coming after you. Why? Because God is trying to what? Make you relevant for him. Does Satan want that? No. No. Why? Because he doesn't want to be executed. That's the only issue Amen. that we're dealing with here. Now back to Job. Do you, does your Bible have headings for chapters and subheadings? Yes. Who has a New American Standard translation? <laughs> no one. Okay. okay. I know one person that has. <laughs> In Job chapter 6, we're not going to touch Job chapter 6, but we're going to find out the validity of what Job's friends lay on him called, I call it, unsolicited advice. Do you like unsolicited, unsolicited advice? <laughs> Haven't you had it with unsolicited advice? Yeah. The heading for Job chapter 6 is, Job's friends are no help. Okay, let's go to Scripture and find out why Job's friends are no help. Job chapter 4, verse 17. Job chapter 4, 17. When you get there, say ready, and I'll read it. Okay, here we go. Job chapter 4, 17. Can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his Maker? Yes or no? Yes. Well, the prevailing teaching in the Christian world today is no way. No way. No way. Is it biblical? Yes. But our good friend Eliphaz is saying to Job, look, you all bend out of shape because you're trying to be good. What's wrong with you? You cannot be good. Let's go to Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. 